probably the question I get more than any other question is, how do you read so much? And it's sort of an unfair question. I mean, I read a lot because it's my job to read a lot. I'm very fortunate. I get paid to read books. That's the perk of being a writer. If I don't read, I can't, can't work. So I think what people are really saying is like, how can they read more? And you should read more because it's a core stoic idea. Marcus Aurelius has a masterful grasp of history. This isn't an accident. He was a huge reader. He, he read so much, he actually had the opposite problem. He talks in meditations, he's like, throw away your books. He's like, focus. He read so much, it was almost a vice. We have to make time to read. And so what I wanted to talk about is how to think about reading in a way that will make it easier for you to make time to read. And then I wanted to talk about some of my strategies strategies for reading, how I make time to read, and how I manage to read, you know, probably uh, between 100 and 200 books a year. Uh, I'm always reading. I'm always going through books. I have a very deliberate reading practice. So here are my strategies for being a better reader, reading more, and making time for reading. One of the best pieces of advice I got about reading came from George Raveling, the great basketball coach. He's a mentor of mine, civil rights pioneer. He said that um, his grandmother called him in uh, to her, her kitchen one day and she said, George, why did the slave masters hide money in books? He said, I don't know, grandma. And she said, because they knew the slaves would never read them. And what he took from that is, is one, that reading is very valuable that um, there's a huge ROI in it. And it's true, right? They don't hide money in books anymore, but in a sense they do. Books cost like 10 bucks, but people don't read them and they don't realize that a book can be the greatest investment you ever make in your life. That's what Warren Buffett said. He said the single best investment he ever made was buying a copy of Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investor. But what George Ravlin told me he took from this was that reading was a moral duty, that people had fought and struggled. Frederick Douglass teaches himself to read basically on, under penalty of death, right? Um, you have to see reading as a moral duty. People struggled and fought and clawed their way to get to a point where books are everywhere and books are easily accessible. So to reject that is just not, it's not just beyond stupid, it's offensive. It's offensive to the people who would have killed for the access to information that you have. You know, the Stoics talk about how basically history is the same thing happening over and over and over again. Marcus Aurelius talks in meditations about how the future is going to be exactly the same as what's happening right now, which is going to be exactly the same as what was happening in the time of Vespasian or any of the other emperors. So this is really important, right? Um, that can be, you can see that as depressing. I see it as a profound insight. If history repeats, then if you want to understand the future, if you want to be able to predict the future, you have to read. One of the best books I read at the beginning of the pandemic was John Barry's The Great Influenza. And that told me everything I needed to know about how to respond to the pandemic in that moment. But it also gave me a real glimpse of how events were going to unfold in the future. My understanding of the Civil War, my reading of Shakespeare, my understanding of history has helped me understand the events happening in the United States since 2016. Right. Um, if you want to understand the future and if you want to understand what's happening right now, the best way to understand current events, like if you want to understand the rise of China and the, the inevitable clash of civilizations between China and, and the United States, go read Thucydides' History of the Peloponnesian War. Thucydides wrote that trying to create a document that would last for all time, and it is a geopolitical masterclass. The, the way to become an informed citizen, people go, but is it, uh, when I talk about don't read the news, right? I say, read books, don't read the news. And people go, but how will I be an informed citizen? And this is silly. The best way to be an informed citizen is not to watch a breaking CNN story or to read the latest piece from the New York Times or worse, whatever, you know, the news site in your filter bubble is. Um, the, the best way to understand current events, again, is through history. John Adams says, there is no history perhaps better adopted to this useful purpose than that of Thucydides. You will find it full of instruction to the orator, the statesman, the general, as well as to the historian and the philosopher, right? Um, uh, Doris Kearns Goodwin 
uh, her book, Leadership in Turbulent Times, which I've recommended. If you want to understand how to be a leader in turbulent times, study the leaders who went through turbulent times. Don't read the latest Harvard Business Review case study, right? Go to the core of it. Go, don't be satisfied with the gist of it. And here's what I find. When I read history, when I read uh, the core primary documents, uh, the, the letters, uh, the, the works the, the works that influence the people who wrote the letters or the constitution or the, the laws. Um, what, I, what I understand is their intention. I understand the real truth of it. And, and th these things are not nearly as politically charged and they're not as biased as they are when you're getting them from, from the news today. Everyone, I think, thinks like, oh, I'm literate. I know how to read. But General Mattis talks about uh, functional illiteracy. He says, if you haven't read hundreds of books, you are functionally illiterate, right? And what he means is that people have been doing whatever it is that you're doing. In my case, being a writer, being an entrepreneur, people have been doing that for thousands of years. So if I don't avail myself of their insight, I'm functionally illiterate. I am, I am stupidly preventing myself from understanding their insights. I am learning by experience what I could be learning from the experiences of others. That's why the Stoics understood history. That's why they read widely. Um, they, they, they knew it wasn't about just reading a little bit. Oh, like Marcus Aurelius talks about how Rusticus teaches him not to be satisfied with just getting the gist of it. He says you have to go to the core of it, right? So my worry is not that uh, I can't read. I know I can read, but my worry is what Mark Twain said. He said, there's no difference between someone who can't read and doesn't read. They are both illiterate, right? So I fear the illiteracy of not having a wide breadth of understanding of the human condition, of history, of events, of philosophy. So I read widely for that reason. The world is a lonely place. It's a scary place. We all feel like we're going through stuff. Um, what I think reading does is reading makes you not alone, right? James Baldwin says, uh, you know, you think your pain is so unique and then you read. Marcus Aurelius felt like, you know, he had the loneliest job in the world. But by studying the other emperors, by studying history, by studying kings, by watching plays in the theater, by reading philosophy, he understood that this is a timeless problem. He understood what his job really was like and what it did to people. And that's why he wasn't corrupted or broken by it. That book is screaming out, trying to connect with someone. This is the, the hard won wisdom of a person. This is experience, this is pain, this is struggle. And, and to not avail yourself of that is so stupid. To not talk to people who have been through what you've been through is, is dangerous. But it's, it's also, to do it is to solve the loneliness and isolation that we feel. Um, it, 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 it's to make us feel connected to other people for all time. You can read, there's this letter from Seneca that he writes, I open my book still and this is the key with it, where he's talking about just being busy and trying and trying to focus in his apartment, but there's all these noises, even meditations, like Marcus Aurelius is writing during the Antonine Plague, and you're like, oh, he went through what we are going through right now. And so again, reading softens solitude and makes you not feel alone anymore. A final note of why you read. Reading is a conversation with wisdom. It's a way to access the wisdom of the past. Zeno, as a young man, uh, goes and he visits the Oracle at Delphi. And the Oracle tells him, uh, you will become wise when you have conversations with the dead. What does that mean? He realizes later as he's standing in a bookstore in Athens that the oracle meant you will become wise when you read. He was reading a book of Socrates and he realized I'm having a conversation with Socrates as if he was here right now. And so reading not only softens solitude, it not only makes you, you know, not functionally illiterate and not only teaches you about the past, it's a way to connect with the past. Um, I feel like over the years, like I know Marcus Aurelius almost as well as I know a friend. Uh, or, or a family member. We've been having an ongoing, con like he is as real to me, Seneca's writing is as real to me as if they actually lived because I've really dedicated myself to understanding them. And because of what they put down in pages, it has produced something that is immortal, right? None of us can live forever. The Stokes obviously knew the idea of memento mori, that none of this lasts and that Marx Aurelius isn't around to enjoy his posthumous fame. And yet he's as real to us uh, in these videos and in, in these conversations as 
as anyone who is alive right now. And I think that's just an incredible idea. And so, you know, yes, sure, we're all ashes and dust, but something survives in the form of books. We can have a conversation with those who are dead and we can learn from their experiences. How do we read more? That's the question, right? So, okay, I've, I've convinced you, you should read more, you know you should. What are some really practical ways to do that? Well, I have a couple tips. One, find the time that works for you. So read in the morning. Hugh Jackman has talked about this recently, that he and his wife read aloud to each other in the morning, before the craziness of the day, um, before they go running around to meetings or, or, or lunches or, any, or, or, or the work that they have to do. He says read in the morning. And, and I like that idea. Um, when I was younger, I used to read in the morning. Now I have young kids, so that's not really my time. But like find the time for, that works for you. So reading in the morning can work really great. Um, the William Osler, who's the founder of John Hopkins Medical School, is a big fan of the Stoics. He recommended that his students read the Stoics or Montaigne or Shakespeare. He says, read before bed, right? He says, slow the day down. He's talking about the relaxing power of reading. That's another great thing. I, I read before bed every night. I, I try to carve a little time. The other thing I do, I try to read while I do other stuff. So I've talked about this before. When I eat, I, I, I go to my, my office and then I read while I eat lunch every day. And that's sort of a quiet time where I read. Yes, the problem is like, this is a book, um, this book is 15 years old now, my copy, and there's like Chinese food stains in it from when I lived in Los Angeles and I was reading it. But anyways, the, the point is find the time that works for you um, and then make that time that you read every day. That's really important. I'm not saying you schedule it, but it's like, hey, when I eat, I read. I read every day uh, when I wake up. Or I read every day before bed. I'm also a big binge reader. Um, so like I'll go on the sort of spurts. So there might be a week where I read several books and then there might be a couple weeks where I'm not reading or I'm just really struggling with one book. Like a, a book like The Power Broker might take me a couple weeks, but I'm always reading and I'm reading short books and long books, but I binge, I go, I get obsessed, I get sucked into subjects and, uh, and I, just, I just go down that rabbit hole. So, so don't think that it, it has to just be this ritualized, like these are the times I read. Yes, generally slow and steady wins the race, but also what really matters is you're just getting through the books, right? That you're, you're, you're making the time, whether it's in batches or like, like, you know, Bill Gates famously has these think weeks. I'm sure he reads a ton on those think weeks. Um, and that probably helps him average out over a lifetime to reading a lot. So again, whatever works for you, don't, don't be okay with binging if that strategy uh, works for you. Right now, that's not what I'm doing, but when uh, life changes and, and I'm traveling again, that will probably change. The other thing is this, this idea of reading a page a day. Um, obviously you should read a lot, but I think what I try to do in the Daily Stoic is like go, how can you spend a year with the Stoics? One page, one meditation a day. We also do the Daily Stoic email, which you can sign up for dailystoic.com slash email. But there's a couple daily books I read. I read this book called uh, A Poem for Every Night of the Year. I read a daily Shakespeare book. I read um, a, a book that Tolstoy wrote called uh, A Calendar of Wisdom. I, I have all these different daily books that I like. And so reading every day, like one page every day, is a way to just really do a deep dive into some content. Don't just read, you have to have a reading practice. So I've talked about this before, but I'll show you. So when I read, I don't just read the book and then I'm done with it. I read, I take notes, I use these flags, um, I fold pages. So when I'm reading, I'm making notes. So you can see some of my highlights here. Um, and I'm, I'm highlighting what I like. And then later I transfer this information over to note cards, right? And this note cards go in what I call a commonplace book. And a commonplace book is a way for me to organize and catalog and capture the information that I read. So again, reading isn't just this thing that I do when I have a few spare minutes, although I do do that. Um, when, when I'm reading, I'm actively engaged with the material and I'm cataloging and capturing the information so I can apply it in my writing, in my talks, in my videos, I can apply it in my life. I have different sections for all the things that matter to me in my life. I have a section of parenting stuff. I have a section of philosophy stuff. I have stoicism stuff. I have strategy. I have examples I like from history. My book, The Obstacle is the Way, began because I, I took a note card from a book called Pierre Hadot, where he talks about turning the obstacles upside down. And as I collected more and more cards about that, that's how the book came. So, so 
catalog and organize the information, build a reading practice. This is really important. And then also the art of rereading, right? I think um, reading a book once is great, but how do you evolve with that book over time? Mark Cerullis talks about how we never step in the same river twice. So people are like, oh, how can I find more books? Maybe you actually don't need to find more books. Maybe you need to go back and revisit the books that have really changed you because you've changed since you last read them. Um, Seneca talks about how we have to linger on the works of the master thinkers. Don't always be chasing the new things. Really engage with the material. So th this is my copy of Meditations. And I, I have a video about how to read Meditations, but I have read this book hundreds of times, literally more than a hundred times. And it's filled with notes, all these different it's got all these different, uh, you know, notations, different pens, different marks, because I've read it so many times. I have chunks of it memorized, and it's it's engaging and re-engaging and engaging and re-engaging and taking notes and using it and applying it that's allowed me to understand it at a level that just would not be the case if I just flipped through it once. The, my copy of The Great Gatsby, which I've, I've kept, I read it once in high school, I read it once in college, I read it probably two or three times in my 20s, I've read it once uh, in my 30s. Um, it, it's, it's a book that I've grown with and I've changed in how I see Gatsby and how I see myself and how I see the 20s. You know, even, even this year I gained a new understanding of the Roaring Twenties fully kind of wrapping my head around the fact that that book was was about a period of time that was a reaction against or was the next step after the great influenza after the 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 spanish flu um after people had been locked down after you know millions of people had died after this terrible tragedy people wanted to party and go crazy and so my understanding of, the, of Gatsby will be different if I read it again since the pandemic. And so the, the art of engaging and re-engaging with the material is really, really important. So I would, if you're like, how can I read more this year? I would actually tweak that and go, what books can I reread this year? The decision to make time to read has been the single greatest investment of my life. It's changed my life. It's opened up countless doors for me. It's made me financially successful, but it's also helped me manage that financial success and also manage the stresses of that success. People have learned hard lessons by experience. They've gone through what you've gone through. If you're not going to make time, if you're not going to learn how to make time, you are rejecting that wisdom and that's ridiculous. So I hope this helps you make some more time for reading, carve out time in your life, follow the examples of the Stoics. And of course, if you want a book to start, here's some The Power Broker by Robert Caro, uh, Roman Honor by uh, Carlin Barton, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl, Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, Seneca's Letters. If you want to check out my books, The Obstacle is the Way, Stillness is the Key, Daily Stoic, Ego is the Enemy. And I would say the last thing, if you are looking to build a reading practice, we built this thing called the Daily Stoic Read to Lead Challenge. It's, uh, it's like two weeks of exercises and practices and, and sort of steps that will help you have a great reading year. You can check that out, dailystoic.com slash reading.